Good evening and welcome to Breaking the Siege, an eyewitness account of Israel's attack on the Gaza flotilla. Um, tonight we'll be hearing from Fiekra O'Luan, an Irish, American, and Palestinian citizen who was on the flotilla in May, uh, which attempted to break Israel's siege on Gaza and deliver food aid to the province. Um, in response, Israeli commandos swept onto the boat, killed nine activists, and illegally detained the rest. Many, including Fiekra, were beaten before being illegally deported to Turkey. Um, so we conceived, we being Brown Students for Justice in Palestine, um, conceived of this event as part of a kind of larger educational campaign to raise awareness about realities on the ground in Palestine um, that are usually misportrayed or underreported, if reported at all, by the mainstream media here in the United States. Um, this educational drive is in turn part of a much larger campaign to get Brown to divest from companies that profit from the illegal Israeli occupation. Um, and we'll have a few members from Brown Students for Justice in Palestine speak about our campaign briefly after Fiakra's talk, and then we'll have time for Q&A following that. Um, so if you're also, if you're interested in getting involved, please, there's a sign-up sheet, um, put your name down, and we'll email you about our meetings and um, future events. Um, but for now, please join me in welcoming Fiakra. Well, thanks very much uh, to Fran Fran Francesca and everybody else for inviting me and making this happen. And um, thanks to all of you who've, uh, who've turned out this evening. Uh, thanks to my family who have bothered coming from Cape Cod. Um, and I also believe we have some uh, Brown students for Israel. And I would actually in particular like to thank you for appearing. Um, these events should never be about preaching to the choir and making ourselves feel good in our own respective worlds and then going back to our own respective corners of that world and not engaging with each other. So uh, I, I appreciate that people of a different opinion may have come here this evening and I look forward to interacting and answering some of their questions respectively along with other people at the end of the discussion. So thank you all for coming. So um, before I went, um, I think I was reading on Ynet or maybe an, an American website, I can't really remember. And I saw something when they learned that one of the ships in the flotilla was coming from Ireland, the Rachel Corrie. They said, OK, we can understand why the Turks are getting involved. And there seems to be a whole load of Muslim people with beards getting involved. But why the hell are the Irish getting involved? What's that got to do with them? The Irish, they're like us. They're one of us. You know? And you know, surely they have enough of their own problems to be dealing with. And, um, and I suppose being here in this country, I think it's a very important place to start. You know, what, for me, I have to ask myself, what does it mean to be Irish? Not in a nationalistic way, but you know, through my heritage and through what makes me tick personally. Um, and I suppose for the Irish, I must explain, first of all, that in Ireland this isn't even a contentious issue. You meet the most conservative politician, and it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of how we should show solidarity and help bring an end to the occupation in Palestine and the Siege of Gaza. Really, it's not even a contentious issue. Um, and it's, I suppose, one of the only issues that reaches Irish people beyond the Civil War, the treaty that has divided our politics for the last 70, 80 years, that we can all really identify with. Because I suppose the Irish, um, similar to the Jewish people, are probably one of the only white people who actually understand what the words ethnic cleansing means. And the horror that, you know, even though I've never experienced it in my life, it is something that makes me shudder and something that I feel in my bones and in the pit of my stomach. And, and I suppose also I'm of the, a generation that witnessed the end of an occupation. And the word occupation means something other than the thing that dad used to have before the recession. You know, it's... Um, an occupation is when you want to go to um, buy some milk on a Sunday and you can be strip searched, you can be shot, you can be threatened and that is a daily occurrence and luckily I didn't live my whole life like that. I was born in Cork which is in the far south of Ireland um, but I was visiting I suppose when I was 11 or 12 I was visiting Derry when the peace process was sort of beginning but not really apparent and for me, I suppose one experience which, which I used to, as an example is on a Sunday I was walking my dog to buy a pint of milk 
on a Sunday morning and the streets were empty and uh, I walked through one of the gates of Derry and, and this bored British soldier about 18 or 19 you know, opened the, opened the shutter of his parapet or whatever, and, uh, and as I turned around the corner he made ratata noises and put his gun and pretended to shoot me and he laughed and I, I was an 11 year old kid and I was like Jesus Christ what the hell please and don't shoot me and he laughed like he thought it was really funny and he's probably he probably did that two or three or four times that day and he forgot that I even existed but to be honest when I've debated different issues in Ireland I remember that because that really for me it reminds me what this could be like if I were to experience this every day of my life not to be able to go anywhere without such <laughs> intimidation and um, and um, and trauma because um, I should also explain that uh, my father's a Vietnam veteran, and I understand that it's not just the people on the receiving end of, uh, of a gun who are traumatized. It's often, very often, the, the young people we put to carry out the policies of xenophobic and, and, uh, and unreasonable governments who, uh, who bear the scars for a long time. And we should never s put the blame squarely on the soldiers. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about conversations I had with IDF members, and including the Mossad, afterwards. Um, so yeah, I suppose that's being Irish in the 21st century. I've sort of made the case that for us to have a meaningful interaction with the rest of the world, that the Irish America and the Irish diaspora really does need to become more of an advocate for those without a voice, and to act as you know an honest broker or whatever. Um, I've spoken to the Minister for Foreign Affairs in Ireland, and that's his. When I'm talking about the issues, he sometimes doesn't want to take certain approaches because Ireland has a role to play as an honest broker. We're respected by, um, by, by all sides, hopefully, and uh, hopefully that will continue. But we do need to get a bit more <coughs> frank about what the issues are and what the, problem, what the solutions could be. So a little bit later I'll talk, I can return, and if, people, if I forget, people could ask me what I think Irish Americans and Americans in general could do. Um, but I suppose to go back, um, how did I get involved, people ask me, because long before this was all over the media, I never expected it to be such an event, really. I was offered the, to crew uh, a, sh a ship on the flotilla, I was told about it, and I said, wow, that's, that's a really practical way of doing something, uh, instead of, hi, you're welcome. 